bit of a history lesson of changes in our farming practices over the last 100 years and what that's actually meant. Um, before I go any further, just acknowledge my co-authors, Mary Ann Young, very um, experienced and respected um, colleague, works for Prime Minister, he's up at Jamestown. I'll actually add Brian Hughes, he's actually sitting down the front. He's, you're not up there, Brian, but I've actually got some material from him and also Joel Ford, a work colleague of mine who actually looks after a lot of our data collection and analysis. So if you think back 100 years, um, where your parents, or grandparents or great-grandparents, how they got their food, basically the, <clears throat> the farming system was based on, on horses, fairly slow, small areas, but mechanisation did actually start to commence. And with mechanisation, um, they actually became more of the, the land become cultivated. Also, also there was um, drought 100 years ago. South Australia was in the grip of drought. There was a war. There was also pressure to increase farming area. And all that, um, with the farming system, led to quite serious erosion. These photos are sort of taken in the 20s and 30s. Um, this is in the mid-north. The uh, top one there, the, the soil is washed off the hill and the, I don't know whether you can see there's actually cracking there, the soil has been deposited on the flat. This is the, the rills, a lot of soil is erosion and often lead it to big gullies like this. Um, out in the Mallee, similar sort of story. You've got a fence totally covered in, in sand. You've got about um, two metres of soil taken away. In fact, um, there's actually a vehicle sitting behind that, the rest of that stump there so that's how it shows you how much soil has been taken out. A couple of metres. And uh, there was a report that farmers actually made more money removing sand off the railway line, because they were getting paid for that, um, than what they were making out of cropping. Now, as a result of this, um, it was the farmers that actually drove this, but also with government. Um, the government commissioned a report from the Soil Conservation Committee on in the erosion. And their, their outcome was, yes, it was the farming system that was actually causing it and it was particularly the wheat fallow rotation and overgrazing. And uh, so they actually set about um, a series of, of processes to actually overcome the problems. And the first one was, was actually they, um, they had the Soil Conservation Act, which was actually proclaimed in 1939. Now, regulation and, and an act like that doesn't actually change behaviour or, um, or, or practices necessarily, but what it did is it committed the government resources to actually overcoming the problem. So all of a sudden they had, they put money into education, into research. You've actually got, um, you got, it's early in the 1900s, but you've got farmers by the wagon loads going to Roseworthy to look at um, latest research. They also put resources into the advisory committee on soil conservation and uh, also an advisory board of agriculture. And from that, we had the agricultural bureaus come out, and they were set up in about 1890, but they built up on that. Soil conservation boards um, came as well, and also the first soil conservator, about 1940, was appointed. So they all worked together, and it was really the, the, um, the research, the educators, the extension people. Um, the other thing, yeah, the government appointed soil conservation officers. I think there was two or three appointed in about 1940, in the key regions, they started working with farmers to overcome and repair the damage. So this is, this is some um, photos of early field days in about the early 1950s. So there they were worried about the big gullies. Here they are building contour banks um, and probably filling in the gullies. And uh, they've got a machine here behind a, behind a tractor which is forming the contour banks. If we go through I'll skip a little bit because um, there's a lot of information about the farmers started planting cereal rye. There was um, fertilisers were available, particularly nitrogen after World War II, so <coughs> they could actually get uh, cereal crops and cereal rye to grow on these sand sand blown areas, stabilise them, which was highly important. But going through to the 80s, the um, that top photo there is one of the early stubble handling soil conservation um, tillage field days up in the mid north near Jamestown. I think there was four or five hundred farmers there that day. That was in the mid 80s. Um, still building contour banks. Notice that machine is almost identical to the one in the 50s. Um, just a newer tractor. The uh, advent of no-till seeding machines. They, they were only really started to become available in the 80s, but they still kept on developing. You got farmers learning from other farmers. Very important. 
um, pastures are a very important part of the rotation. Here, looking at um, a clover or medic uh, crop there, and also the whole no-till. Um, farmers are very sceptical. Can you actually put a crop in without just without stirring up the soil, without cultivating it? Um, and uh, and we actually showed that we could. Um, the no-till systems developed even further uh, with time. So you've um, um, you be able to keep stubbles, and this was was happening in the 90s and, and early 2000s. Um, but in more recently, got bigger machinery. The farmers were keeping more stubble, standing stubble, standing stubble, and uh, with the GPS guidance, you could actually sow the crop in between the previous uh, row of stubble. Um, so that would made a significant improvement. And uh, once again, it was still with the farmers working together with other people and helping each other. Um, there's a couple of young farmers who are actually working out the feed on offer and amount of cover there at a field day. One of the common techniques now for farmers when their uh, paddock feed is getting low, they, with, that's a confinement feeding area uh, for the livestock, um, so the livestock aren't travelling all over their paddocks and disturbing it. Um, we've got the GPS guidance, which has been a real benefit for even spraying, and uh, which helps to control traffic. And uh, this one down here, that's actually the chairman of our local, the South Australian No-Till Farmers Association. And uh, this is towards the end of February, and he's actually showing, showing off his soil. Now that crop, the, the stubble would be above my knee. It's a little bit flattened there. I was working in this area over 30 years ago, and I, could, I wouldn't have believed you could actually sow a crop with that amount of standing stubble. It was probably a, a five-tonne crop, so there's seven or eight tonnes of standing stubble there. Um, and he's got a disc seeder, and he, he sows through that. Um, and the critical thing there, yeah, he's, he's showing off the tilth of his soil, quite friable. Admittedly, he did have a little bit of rain the week prior. I was involved in some field trials on his father's and grandfather's property, which is only a couple of hundred metres from this paddock. And that time of year, 30 years ago, that would have been like concrete. So it just shows you what change has actually happened. And this is some data that we actually collect and um, we actually do field surveys looking at the erosion risk. And we've actually projected back um, what we thought the farming systems were going back 70 or 80 years. So the land was at risk for, we think, about 150 days per year. And that was based on the old wheat fallow system. So across the agriculture area, it's no wonder the, the erosion occurred. And with the adoption of better practices, that's declined. Now, based on our estimates, the, uh, the amount of risk is about two weeks. So that's all good and great, but what happens... Oh, that's the farming systems from there to there. It's made a dramatic difference. However, despite all that, things do go wrong. And uh, this is just an example of what's actually happened the last few months at Pinery. Um, the Pinery fire burnt over 80,000 hectares, nearly 100 houses, 500 sheds, goodness knows how many livestock. Absolutely devastating. Um, but what this, this is the, the real impact that was happening virtually the same day as a fire or within a day. So you've actually got, that's the still burning, um, either you've actually got sand, you've got dust blowing off those, those fragile soils. Can you imagine 80,000 hectares are absolutely bare? And uh, that's probably worse than what it was in the 1940s. They, put, they wouldn't have had um, that amount of landscape bare. And what actually happened here is you had huge biomass, you know, 10 tonnes per hectare of biomass burning, nearly wall-to-wall -wall cropping. You had a comment about this the other day, Wayne. Um, so what did the farmers actually start doing about it? I'll just show you a, um, a video here. Brian tells me, Brian Hughes took this video and he tells me this is one of the stable panels. Uh, the wind's coming over his left shoulder. And that's about three or four days after the fire. You can actually see the sweeping on the ground there. Um, so this is, you know, just an example of that was the visibility, I think, um, that day or, or a few days beforehand, just on a side road. You know, that, the amount of dust, 
very common scene, burnt out headers, that's where they, you know, farmers were probably lucky to get out with, with their lives, let alone saving any machinery. Just out of that shot, there's a huge big field bin um, and a couple of tractors burnt out also. Uh, this is a photo taken a day or two after rain and the soil was drifting again and that's more like a scene of northern Europe in winter. Um, and this shows you the erosion on the side of the road. And uh, the interesting thing is, is that as devastating as it was for farmers, you know, some of them lost their houses, they lost their machinery, lost their, their sheds, and that was devastating. If you really, what was really gut-wrenching for them was losing their soil. So um, within a few days of the fire, you actually had farmers instigating farmers with help from prime industries and the, the NRM boards. They actually got together, they organised a field day on emergency tillage. Now that was, um, I think there was over 200 that actually attended that and that was within five days of the fire. And uh, here you've got one of the farm leaders, critical for making these things happen. He was affected by the fire. Um, here he is helping other farmers, explaining what he's doing or how we can help each other. So this is an example of some of the emergency tillage they did and others of, um, of sandy soil. Um, tillage doesn't work there because you can't bring up any clay to, to roughen it up. They put out some hay or straw and worked that in and that's helped a little bit. So um, it, just, it just goes to show that there's probably more work that needs to be done sort of managing after the fire, but that was, that was an event where we're actually still learning from that about how we can manage the soil in the future. Thanks, Craig.